Have you ever taken orders from somebody who was not in the position to give you orders? It's not fun, is it? It kind of doesn't feel right. Unless, however, it's a little kid, it's a little girl at tea time, and she's telling you, okay, you sit here, okay, now you, you, know, you eat this pretend cookie, and here's, you know, you got to follow orders. Or you're playing with a little boy, and it's, it's dinosaur time, you know, and, and I'm always the T-Rex, you know, rawr, and, you know, we're pretending, and I'll, I'll take orders from a little kid, uh, even though he's not in a position of authority over me, he's not my boss, um, but you know, so that's okay. But have you ever been given instruction to somebody who is not your boss, and you're like, I'm sorry, you're telling me what to do right now? You're not the boss of me. We want to turn into the little kid, right? Or um, somebody who is your boss, but maybe you don't respect very much, and so it's like, I don't want to really hear your words right now, right? Have you ever been in a position like that? Um, and, and sometimes it, it can be a little like, I don't know, should, should we really be doing what you're saying, and, and Why? It's a lot easier to take instruction from somebody who you respect, who you look up to, and uh, who does have a position, but sometimes the position doesn't always mean much if that respect and that care for that person that is over you when they're giving you instruction. We find Matthew shares with us some of the final words that Jesus had with his disciples. It was actually some instructions Now, Jesus being their rabbi, he did have authority over them, but as we see in the Gospels that Jesus loved them and cared for them in a way that they knew that they were loved and cared for. In fact, even as their rabbi, in the last meal together, he washes their feet, a job for the lowest of the servants. He showed them, you guys, I I love you. I care about you. And so in these last instructions, For his disciples and any other follower that had been listening right there on that hilltop, I am it's more than likely that they were able to receive this instruction. They were able to receive this command that he was giving them before he leaves. And so we're in Matthew chapter 28. It will be on the screen, but if you have a Bible with you or your device, you want to open that up. This is titled Matthew 28, the Great Commission. The Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. I want us to read this. I'll read it for you as you follow along. Matthew says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Now, if you're confused because you thought, wait a minute, I thought there were twelve. There were twelve. One of them hung himself as a response to his betrayal. And you can read about that. Uh, Dig in yourself. We're not going there, but if you're like, whoa, hold on a second, what's happening? That's what the backstory on that is. So, they're on this, uh, they went to this mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him. Recognize that. They followed where God told them, where Jesus told them to go. And when they saw him there, they worshipped him. Now we're talking about his disciples. If you were with us last week, these are the same disciples that saw Jesus face to face. And Jesus said, I am risen. It is me. Peace be with you. And they got to see and touch and experience and hear this resurrected Jesus. And they were so thankful and overjoyed. And here it carries on to worship to their God. But there's some that doubted. There are some still that doubted. Now, this may have been some folks that were on the fringe that really were just kind of figuring out, whoa, 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 he didn't, he die on a cross. And wait, he said he was the... And he did all these other things, and his he, I don't know, I'm not sure. And so there's some that doubted, and there's some that worshiped. So we have folks on both sides of the fence. In verse 18, Matthew tells us that Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And then Jesus finishes with the promise, and surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. Now, he wasn't talking to just one specific lady named Shirley, okay? It was everybody. Shirley and everybody else, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. So recognize we have a group that's gathered where Jesus said to gather, Disciples and others, some are worshiping, some are interested, intrigued, some are actually doubting. They gather there, and then Jesus says, what does he say? All authority 
has been given to me. All authority in heaven, all authority on earth has been given to me. Now, how could they believe that all authority has been given to him? Because what did he just do? He just defeated death. He literally came up out of the grave and proved to them that he cannot be held back by a big stone, by the Roman government, by death itself. He proved to them and to us today and to the entire world that all authority in heaven and on earth is given to him because he rose from the grave. I am the Almighty God, and I just proved that to the entire world. So Jesus, he places himself in a position of authority, of a position of power, and then he uses this platform and credibility to commission his followers and all those listening, but specifically to his followers, those who say yes to him or should say yes to these words that Jesus gives them. Well, what are these words? Now that he said, hey, I've proved that I have all power and I have authority, but he's not saying I'm the boss of you, but he's saying, hey, I have command here. And then he says, now you, I want you to therefore go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. He tells his followers to go and make other followers of Jesus. In these final words of Jesus, here on earth, we find two powerful purposes for each believer, specifically to the followers then, and that carries to us today. Two powerful purposes. Now, the church in these words are evangelism and discipleship. Now, what we mean by that is some would say, well, it's the going and, and then growing, or it's the reaching and the teaching. Some would say it's, it's finding the lost and growing the found. Evangelism and discipleship, it's going and sharing the good news of the gospel, and then it's helping them learn what that looks like to live according to the gospel of the good news. So Jesus' followers are to go. Don't stay here. Don't stare looking at the sky like, wow, I can still see him. Jesus is going back up to heaven. He's ascending right now. But look, look, I still, you see, I don't see, no, the dot next to that big cloud. That's Jesus. He's still here. No, it's go. Like, get out of here. Go and do what I've asked you to do. Don't keep staring and wondering if you still, and don't come back to this point and going, is he still there? Tomorrow. You know, should we come back tomorrow and see? Cause he, no, he's gone. He's given you instructions. So G-O, go. And I want you to go and I want you to make disciples. Now, this is, when you say make disciples, this isn't like I'm going to make a table out of pallet wood or I'm going to make dinner or I'm going to make my dog listen to me and I'm going to train him, okay? This isn't forcing something. This isn't taking ingredients and putting them together and making something happen. This isn't that because we're talking about another person here. We're talking about another person that has their own will, that has their own Um, you know, belief system that has their own way that they can go. It's not just a meal or a piece of wood or a dog. These are other people that we are going and making. So in other words, you can't force anybody to follow Jesus. You can't just say, okay, you're going to do this and do this, and then here we go, okay? (laughs) Good boy, give a treat. You know, that's not how it works. You don't force somebody into believing. I'm going to make you believe in Jesus and follow him. For Jesus' disciples, go and make is living out what they have already believed in and sharing with them what God has already done in their lives. See, Jesus said, I want you to go and make disciples and I want you to give them everything that I've already given you. For the disciples, it meant taking the good news. What was the good news? He rose from the grave. And he gives new life to those that believe in him. That was the good news. The good news translated into the word gospel. So this gospel was theirs to go and to share with everyone that anybody who believes in Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, would have eternal life. That was the good news. That was the gospel. And it was worth sharing. You don't share bad, I mean, some people like to share bad news, but good news, like, oh, dude, check it out. Look what happened. I want to share that kind of news with with friends. It's worth sharing. And this gospel, this good news is worth sharing. But I want to help us remind us what the gospel is. It's not turning people into something else that we think that they should be. It's not a religion. In fact, here's a quote for you. It says, the gospel is not about making people religious. 
It's about finding the lost and bringing them home. And every one of us at some point was lost. And we find the Lord, we find our way home. This mission, it's not pointing to the sin or pointing to the problem like, yo, bro, you messed up. Hey, girl, you got, no, that's not. No, it's pointing to Jesus, not the sin, not the problem. But it's pointing to him. It's pointing to the good news because that's the news worth sharing. It's pointing to the truth, the rescue, the light, the way, Jesus. Now remember who Jesus is giving this instruction to. Who is he saying, go and make disciples? I have all authority. Now I'm asking you to go and do some pretty cool, interesting, amazing, awesome things. I want you to go do that. Who is he talking to? He's talking to an ordinary group of people. His disciples, young men, not fully theologically trained men, ordinary people like you, and I mean, are you calling me ordinary? I'm sorry, I didn't know that you were super ordinary. <laughs> well, for the rest of us, just like you and me, He is sharing this commission, this instruction to go and change the world? Hold on, are you sure you got the right batch of folks? I mean, there are others, some people that probably know more languages than the ones I know. I could probably, you know, I might be able to share because I have more language. I have more understanding of, of, of the book of Revelation. I really understand it. So I can probably be better fit to go and make disciples. Well, I don't know. I've been a Christian for 37 years, and, and you know, I've got a lot of experience under my Christian belt. <laughs> I got crosses all around it. It's pretty cool, yeah. We are ordinary people saved by the same grace, all in need of the same Jesus. He's the one that's extraordinary. He calls every one of us just like then and now to go. They didn't have it all figured out, and neither do we, but we're called to go. Jesus sends them. He sends them to go to all nations. This good news was not just for the Jewish nation anymore. It was for everyone who would listen and believe. So he sends them out, every people group, every language, every age. The disciples were to share the news with their town, then go to the next town, then go to the neighboring country, and so on and so forth. This was the commission of the followers. They were sent. And what's true for the followers then is true for Jesus' followers today. You and I have been sent by God to go and make disciples of all nations. You have been sent by God to go and make disciples. You are sent. Don't leave because that's how I finish my sermons. But you are sent I want you to look at the person next to you and remind them, you are sent. Go ahead. Give them a nudge if they're asleep. You are sent. Overflow, go ahead. Tell them. You are sent. Okay, we are sent. But don't leave yet. Hold on. We've got to finish. You are sent to go and make disciples. Now, the going starts right here. Okay, the going starts right here. It starts right here, and then it goes there. And then you go over there, and then you go way out there. Okay, so I want you to pick these circles of influence. Like, well, I know the, the, my right here. Who's in your right here circle? See, we are all sent, and it starts right here. You and I, we're all sent. It starts right here. I want to ask you, who's in your right here circle? Who's your close family, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors? These are the people that you see more than once in a week three, four, five, six times in a week. These are in your right here circle. When we are go, we are all sent and it starts right here. I want you to think about that. Who's in my right here circle? But then God may move your focus to sharing the gospel from right here to over there. God may put a burden on your heart for people you don't really know by name, but you're familiar with their situation. God may put people in your heart that are over there. These are those that you, that are on your radar. Maybe there might be, you know, at-risk kids or teens in your community right here in GP. And those are the people over there. Maybe it's single parents that you're aware of and God's put a burden for you to share the gospel with them. That's the people right over there. Maybe it's other businessmen or community leaders, people, that you, some of your peers within the same industry area that you work. Those are the people over there. 
God may be calling you to share the gospel over there. But remember, it starts right here, and then we move over there, and then sometimes God calls us out there. You may sense a God, a call from God to go out there. God may be leading you to become a missionary in a whole other country. And that's what we mean by out there, somewhere not like your own home. I was privileged to grow up in a missionary home. My parents and my grandparents, both missionaries in the Nazarene Church. And we were sent over there in all parts of Central and South America. God uses us right here. He uses us over there. And he uses us out there. Are we listening to that call? But let's not forget that God sends every one of us and it starts right here. Now, Jesus didn't give his followers an exact vision, discipleship making process in that moment. He didn't say, now here's the strategy, folks. All right, huddle in. Now we have come up with our own strategy of discipleship making. And it's on the wall as you go out. We want people to know God. We want people to find freedom. We want them to discover their purpose and then make a difference in this world. That's what we want. Now, that's our discipleship strategy. That's what we hope to see in everybody that comes across um, us as a believer at Pursuit Church. But Jesus didn't give them a grid or a graph or a cool little emblem to follow. He just gave us two instructions as a framework to make disciples. Just two instructions. And what were these instructions? Number one, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the second one was teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Okay, I'm going to go back over that. I want you to help me fill in the blank. It's not on the screen, but you can do this. It's one word. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. We're going to try that again. Overflow. I want you to hear you too, okay? You're going to teach them everything I have commanded you. Good. Great. Everything I've commanded you. So in other words, we are to help people know God by teaching them, showing them, and guiding them in what God has already taught and guided and revealed to you. This is so important. This is so important because when we talk about going and making disciples, we think just evangelism, we're just going, let's just go, you know, let's just make as many converts as possible. Let's just fill heaven. Come on, let's do it. Now, I love the enthusiasm. I think it's great. But we're not just called to have people go, yes to Jesus, yes to Jesus, okay, move on next, yes to Jesus, okay, move on, yes to Jesus, okay, move on. Oh, you're not... Oh, you want, oh, really? You're not going to, come lift up? Okay, yes, okay, move on. It's not about filling heaven or making converts. It's about making disciples, which means he wants, God wants us to share everything that he's doing in us because it's about life transformation. Making a disciple isn't just inviting someone to church and letting the pastor do the rest of the work. Making disciples means I am personally responsible and God has put a burden on my heart for somebody in my right here circle and I'm going to reach them. And when they come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I'm going to walk beside them and share with them. I'm going to, I want to teach them how to pray if they don't know how to pray. I want to show them what God's Word looks like. I want to show them how, how here's how you look through it. It's chapter, verse, and here's the, use the index. You're going to table of contents. I still use it. It's okay to still use it. And we're going to show them, hey, John, it's a great place to start. And James is all about like, this is how my faith goes into action. And we take on that responsibility. Now, I know you're thinking, I'm not trained for that. I'm not ready for that. But if the Holy Spirit is living in you, you are ready for that. Don't sell yourself short. You don't have to go through discipleship class 101, which we do not offer, but we should. That's a great idea. I'm going to remind me, would you guys text me later on? We need a, a course like that. Actually, we do have one called My Journey. And it's been a while since we've offered it, but it's all about establishing spiritual disciplines in my life. We, and that's how you become a disciple, discipleship maker is when you grow in your faith, then you are ready to share that faith with somebody else. Discipleship is basically helping another person grow in their faith. You are along their side, spurring them on. Yes, you. I'm here with you, but so is the person next to you, and so is the person behind you, and so is your spouse. We're in this together. We can do this together. Because God has brought you through a situation and you're going to share it with them. God has done something miraculous in your life, and you are going to share it with them. God has taught you something new, and you're going to share it with them. 
God has brought transformation in your life and you're going to share it with them. That's you. Because your story has meaning. Your faith walk has purpose. And this is what we mean by make disciples. We have to own this together. This is not just drop them off at church and hopefully when they come out, it'll, they'll be all better. This is not Christian daycare. This is go and make disciples. Every one of us as a follower of Jesus are commissioned. We are all sent. And then Jesus instructs us to baptize them in his name. Why baptize in his name? Because baptism is a powerful symbol and it tells the world around you that that person belongs to God. And God is the one who's done the work. We are saved by his name and his name alone. You might be coming alongside them and you are doing great work in them, but guess what? You don't save them. We have a chance to bring people to the Savior. He's the one that does the work. So we baptize in his name because he's the one that does the saving work and they belong to him. But we are together the family of God. This is the great commission. This is the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I have commanded you. This is the great commission. It's not the great suggestion. It's not the great proposal. Jesus goes, have I got a proposal for you? And if it's good enough, I hope you follow through. No, this is the great commission. This is the great command. This is the instruction to his followers. But then Jesus finishes with a promise. I love that. He finishes with the promise. And what's his promise? I will be with you to the very end. You are not alone. God will always be with you. He'll be by your side in the moments when you're like, I don't know about this going and making thing. I'm still figuring out myself. Yes, we know that. We all are in a process, right? We're so thankful that God's not done with us yet because we're all a work in progress. God will be with you. He'll literally give you the words when you need them. He'll give you the insight when it's needed. But we've got to be walking with him. This statement from Jesus that I will be with you to the very end of the age, it reminds us that even though we are doing work of ministry, God is the one leading the way and providing the power for us to be his witnesses. Right here, over there, and way out there. The power that we receive from the Holy Spirit only comes in relationship with Jesus. In other words, we've got to stay plugged in to Jesus Christ. We've got to stay plugged in to the power. Don't you love it how they make vacuum cables just long enough to almost reach the corner of the room? You know what I'm saying? Like, really? Like, I was, I was almost done, and it, it all got unplugged. But what happens when you go back and plug it? You got to go back before it takes off on you, right? If you have the self-propelled. I don't know if they still, anyway. They don't have those anymore. But it's the old Kirby ones, right? Didn't they have it like it would, or was that a mower? I don't know. Anyway. Okay. I know my vacuums. <laughs> I mean, not the greatest about them, but. Anyway, I use them at home. I'm just saying, okay? What I'm saying is you got to stay plugged in if we want to see this life continue to work out. That's what I'm saying. If we want to go all the way out there, we have to stay plugged into the source. That means we need to be fully committed followers of Jesus. Be a light worth shining. We need to be a light worth shining. I bought these little lights at Harbor Freight, and they're like a LED. They have like a Velcro thing, and they have a little switch on them. Have you seen those? Have you have to have those? Okay. Um, and, and they're great. They're great little things. Like, oh, you can put that anywhere, you know? And I put one inside my boy's closet because it's all dark in there. Um, and I put one somewhere else, and I realized that the battery life on these things are not very good. I mean, you, if they just, they're not the greatest light. You know, it looks cool, it's great, but it's a little tiny thing, a little tiny battery, just like, eh, you know, after a while, it's just not really. Is this really a, life, a light worth keeping? You know, I'm, I'm second-guessing this great purchase that was only $2. <laughs> hmm, here's your sign. Let's be a light worth shining. I'm talking like D battery, big old mag light, right? Like let's stay connected to the power so that when we shine, we are a light worth shining. But that only happens in relationship with Jesus. Your relationship, your growth 
And your faith matters to the world because that's how we stay plugged in to our light and allows our light to be worth shining because we can only shine as bright as the light that is within us. So keep pursuing your heavenly Father. Keep growing and you will keep shining. And then when we go and make disciples, they go, whoa, that's a light. That's a way. That's a truth. That's the life that I want. Forgiveness by Jesus and life everlasting. So we are sent. You and I, we are sent to reach. But whose job is it to save? I want to ask you, overflow, sanctuary, whose job is it to save? Okay, Jesus. If I ever set you up, the answer is always Jesus. Okay, it's the classic Sunday school. Don't be afraid. It's always, the answer is always Jesus, all right? We are sent, we go reach, but whose job is it to save the lost? Jesus, well done. Jesus and Jesus alone. He prepares our hearts to come to him. He died on the cross for us. He's the only one who can redeem and rescue and restore us and the world. And we reach and Jesus rescues. Because Jesus is the true bread of life. We are just one beggar telling another beggar where to find the bread. We are sent people. Pursuit Church. Jesus instructs his followers to go and make disciples. And that's you and me. This isn't some other church. This isn't the disciples of back then. This is a commission for his followers. And if you say yes to Jesus, stay connected because you and I are sent people. I want us to take us on a a short journey through a campaign called Each One Reach One. Now, this is an old school Nazarene slogan, but I'm bringing it back. Kind of like the mullet, okay? I'm going to bring it back. Old Nazarene slogan, but it still rings true today. Each one, reach one. And here's how it works. We're going to identify, every one of us, somebody who God has put in our life that doesn't know him as Lord and Savior. And we're going to start right here. And we're going to start with one. And I want you to think about who has God placed in my life. Now, if, it, if it's going to take you a day or a couple of days to really think and pray on the one person, now, I'm not limiting you. You're like, dude, I've got three. I've got five. That's great. Then you are in the each one reach three campaign. And we're right there with you, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to say, Lord, I will seek after you first. That's what I'm going to do. Lord, I want to be plugged into you. I want to be a disciple. I want to be a light worth shining. So I'm going to focus in on my life. And as I do that, Lord, I'm going to ask you, show me a person. And each one of us is going to reach one. And then here's how we're going to do it. It's a three, three stages. Number one is we're going to pray for that person. Number two is we're going to love on that person. And number three is we're going to share with that person. Now, let me break these down for you. Number one is we're going to pray for them. When God puts this person in your mind, remember, you are the disciple maker. Yes, you can invite them to church. Yes, they might, may find Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in a church service here or maybe somewhere else. But you are going to be the one to walk alongside of them, and we get to do it together. So you're going to pray for them. Pray for them by name. I'm going to, I'm going to ask that you pray for them. Lord, would you, would you just bring somebody else in their life that would show them Jesus as well? Lord, would you, when they're, they're driving down the road or listening to the radio, would you put a song that points them to you? God, when they're at work and they are completely frustrated, would you show them somehow that you're the answer? Would you, God, would you just... Would you bring something in their life, even if it's, a, if it's a thing that I wouldn't want them to go through because it's difficult, but would you do that so that they can see you? We're going to pray for them. Number one, we're going to pray for them. Number two is we're going to love on them. Now, love on them. Now, some of us may go, how do I, I'm not loving on somebody, you know, I'm going to love on my wife and that's it. You know, what do you mean love on somebody? Well, that's what I mean. It means you care about them. That means you listen to them when they're talking. You're not like, mm-hmm, yeah, whatever, mm-hmm, mm-hmm okay, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. I almost did the typewriter thing. <laughs> that was old school. Well, I know, right? Woo, I go way back. <laughs> now you're trying to guess, like, how old is he? I don't know. It just, he looks 24, but I don't think that's right. I, <laughs> at 20. <clears throat> anyway, 
19, actually. Anyway, where were we? Oh, yeah, love on them. You're going to care about them. You're going to listen to them. Okay, ladies, if, if someone's like sharing, you're, you're going to say, tell me more. You might have a great story too, but let their story trump yours for a minute, okay? Let them talk. Guys, you might be like, hey, dude, you want to go fishing? Like, let's, you've been talking about needing a day out. Like, let's go. Let's do this. Like, it just means caring. It means listening. It means paying attention to. That's how we're going to love on them with the love of Jesus. And if it's somebody who God puts in your heart that you're like, oh, really? Them? How in the world? You just go, just, just smile and wave, boys. Like, Lord, I'm just going to do this because you're asking me to do it. And so I'm going to try to love on them. God will give you what you need. And thirdly, share with. What do I mean by that? When it's the right time, God will give you an opportunity to share with them. Now, it might be your story. It might be your story because, you know, when you start sharing your story with somebody, you're like at a personal level where you're like, dude, I think you're, you know, I, I want to share something with you. Like, dude, I, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Man, I once was broken, but now the Lord has brought healing. I once was, but now, and you can share your story. In that story, they will hear the story of Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. But we got to be ready for it. We've got to be prepared to share the gospel story, and it will turn, and they'll, they might ask more questions, and you might say, hey, can I pray for that need? And you're going to be sharing with them. You're opening up your mouth with them, and you're receiving what the, what their, their story, and you're saying, I want to come alongside of this, and then we're going to share with. So each one's going to reach one. We're going to ask the Lord, bring someone to mind, we're going to pray for them, we're going to love on them, and we're going to share with them. Now, this is not going to just take three days or a week or three months. This may take years. Are we ready for that? Are we ready to say, Lord, I know who you put on my heart. It's about you investing in someone's life as you walk with Jesus so that they can also walk with Jesus. Think of the impact that Pursuit Church, just Pursuit Church, could have in Grant's Pass if each one reaches one. Think about the impact we can have actually on the world because of the impact that they'll have on other people. Just by praying for, loving on, and sharing with one person. Um, in your bulletin, you should have received in your bulletin a card. If you didn't get a bulletin, these will be up here and then on your way out. And this is a card that just reminds us, each one reach one. This is for you to take home. Write the name of a person who God has put on your heart to pray for, love on, and share with. And I want you to put this, you can take multiple if you need to put them in different places. And I want you to put this somewhere where you're going to remember step number one, to pray for them. I also want it to be a reminder for you to keep growing towards the Lord. To allow your light to shine before men. May it be a reminder to you to spend time in prayer. May it be a reminder to you to say, Lord, I want your word to transform me because I know you want to transform them. Take this card as a reminder for yourself. But what I want us to do is I want us to celebrate this together. I want us to pray for each other together. So this is for you to take home, but I want us to do something before you leave today. If you're ready, if you're not ready, then maybe come back this week, come back next Sunday, and out in the foyer. So uh, for those of you in the sanctuary, if you go out the back door, you'll see there's a big bulletin board back there on the foyer wall. An overflow, you may, you'll have to come this way to check it out. And there's markers hanging up. These are Sharpies, different colors. I want you to write on that board. They don't erase, by the way. So it's not like you, no, if you go like that, it's just going to smear and whatever, and that's all right. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect, so don't worry about it. But I want you to think about the person that God is asking you to reach. And I want you to put their first name on that board. This is so that we collectively, as a church, can pray for them. Now, if for whatever reason you don't think that putting their first name on that board is a good idea, then give them an alias. Give them another name that you know them by. <laughs> I don't know why you wouldn't want to, because the gospel's for all men, for all women, for all people. Let's put their name down. And maybe it's a different bill than everybody else is thinking. You know, I don't know. <laughs> but everybody needs Jesus, and so why not pray for them? So I'm going to ask you to do that. I'm going to ask you to put that first name on that board back there. Take one of these cards home or multiple and begin to pray for so that God gives you opportunity to love on so that when the time is right, you can share with the gospel, the transforming gospel of Jesus Christ, what he's doing in your life. Because every one of us are a sent people. It's every one of us' responsibility to continue to grow our faith so that it makes a difference in the life of other people. 
And you know what? When someone comes to know the Lord Jesus as Savior, we're going to celebrate that. We're going to throw a party because in heaven they throw a party. We're going to honor the Lord. We're going to baptize in his name and, and show that God's the one doing the saving work. I'm not sure yet what we're going to do with the bulletin board. I'm open to any ideas. You know, there's, you could put like PTL. We could find one color, put PTL, which means praise the Lord. You know, we could circle them. Um, you know, we could white them out. You know, I don't know what, you know, I don't want to misinterpret it any of these ways, but so I'm open to anything. You know, we could, yeah, hi, I heard a word highlight. That'd be kind of cool too. But what we're doing is we're praying for these people. And we're saying, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, we're a part of this together. So that challenge is out there for every one of us. I'll be participating in this with us. And just remember, even if that bulletin board is gone, and that name we should still be praying for if they don't know the Lord Jesus as Savior, let's not give up. The Lord did not give up on us. Aren't we thankful for that? Amen. Let me close this in a word of prayer. Would you bow your heads? Overflow and sanctuary, let me just speak to you for a minute with your heads bowed, your eyes closed. There might be somebody here that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior and you're like, man, my name should be on that bulletin board. I don't know Jesus, but I want to. I know that he is light. He's the life. He's the truth. He is the way. I've realized that today and he's the thing that I need in my life. If that's you this morning, we want to pray for you as you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And it's simply saying, God, I know that you have a plan for me, but I also know that my sin is in the way. It's simply saying, Lord, I believe that you died on the cross and rose again for me, and I'm thankful for that. And it's simply saying, I confess you are my Lord and Savior, and salvation is ours. We receive life now and eternal life in heaven. And if you want to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I know most of us in here are believers, but there might be somebody who is coming back to church, coming back to the Lord, and they want to give their life to Jesus today, and I want to pray with you. And so if that's you, you would just lift up your hand and say, Pastor Rex, would you pray for me? I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and we're going to pray for you this morning. Anybody like that this morning? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, the challenge to reach somebody because we know that you're the one that saves and we thank you for that. Lord, you're already putting people in our hearts and minds. And God, we believe that you are a God that can transform a life, any life. Lord, there may be somebody here who didn't raise their hand and that's okay that they didn't raise their hand. It's really their heart and they may want to receive you as Lord and Savior, confess that they are a sinner, and believe that you have a plan for them. And so if that's what's happening right now, Lord, then I pray that you will hear their prayer of salvation as they say yes to you, as they say yes to eternal life, and they say yes to following after you. We thank you for that, and we celebrate that, Lord Jesus. God, would you go before us, go with us, empower us with your spirit to be a witnesses right here, over there and way out there as you call us into every part of our world. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We thank you for your love for us that we see through your son, Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, amen. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace today. Amen. You are sent. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in to today's teaching at Pursuit Church. We pray that the teaching today will encourage your faith in Jesus Christ to draw you closer to Him and give you a better understanding of His Word. If there's a way that we can minister to you, pray for you, or encourage you in your faith, please reach out to us on our website, PursuitNazarene.org, and click on Connection Card. Also, you can share this video with others and encourage them. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.